questions at any time. <laughs> um, I just do a little introductory just for the, the webcast. Anyway, this is the Rocky Mountain Inventors Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit educational group. Been around since 1978, and um, we meet the second and fourth Mondays of the month uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. at 1101 South Washington in Denver. And uh, we do a variety of uh, topics from funding and finance to manufacturing prototype, marketing promotion, entrepreneurs come in, accounting people, um, and anything else that is, that is suggested. Uh, our upcoming presentation, uh, the, uh, the early November one, the second Monday in November, uh, we have a dentist tool that's a product that's being launched. It's a new way to fill cavities, so everybody get excited. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's been patented in the United States and Europe and uh, trademark too. So it's, uh, it's a device that uses this new uh, ultraviolet light curing for composite materials in the tooth cavity. <clears throat> That's uh, known in the art, but um, on these composites, uh, when you, you put them in, it goes in as a paste, and then uh, right now they have a separate light to cure it. Okay, so when you, when you cure it, the material shrinks like 2%. So it, 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 it pulls and it can create cold shuts. It's kind of like a not the greatest casting and if it, if it creates any porosity. And we're talking micro scale. Like this is a hole that's drilled probably one millimeter in diameter. They're tiny. You know, the dentist has a magnifying glass, but porosity in that cavity, of course, causes you to have hot and cold sensitivity and it's further uh, cavity points in the future. So the, the, the better the quality of the, uh, let's say the, um, the film material, it, the homogeneous nature of it and into the hole, the better the cavity, the longer the life. So um, what they've done is the, the pick that compacts the uh, film material is made out of sapphire. So it's, it's an industrial sapphire. So it's, it's clear like glass. It's very tough stuff, very tough stuff. And you, you put it in and you, you apply pressure to the composite and the light travels through the sapphire while you're curing. So when it does this 2% shrinking, you keep pressure on it. And then the way cavities are filled is they layer up to the top and then they grind smooth with the contours of the, uh, the cusps of the teeth. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was nice and novel. The, the only place sapphire had been used in dental tools was for light lenses to look in the mouth, but never as an active compacting tool. So the prior art was the dentist would have to have the, the stainless steel pick, put it in, pull it out, because he can't ultra light through it, and they'd alter light on it and then put a layer on. So anyway, they, they, the product's made, it's patented, it's trademarked, it's just getting through FDA. And um, they've had a lot of field testing with dentists and they, they like it. So you'll probably be seeing one. <laughs> that you can think. <laughs> So the um, so oddly enough, the, the the other aspect of patentability is um, holding the sapphire in the handle, because we have two very dissimilar materials. We have a ceramic and a metal. They couldn't really make the whole handle out of sapphire. So that's that's uh, another aspect of patentability. Plus the method of doing the filling. Was, was also in there. So anyway, that's gonna be early, or the, the second Monday, November. The fourth one, I've got an inventor coming in as talk about his uh, project bomb outs <laughs> <laughs> that he spent tens of thousands of dollars on. And then uh, last, we've got um, early December, 
Second Monday, I've got uh, Jennifer Rothschild on Provo, Pat, for that. And the next year, we've got to uh, line up several funding and finance, crowdsource funding people coming in, venture capitalists, angels, uh, of that sort. I got a, uh, we're going to meet at a guy's facility, does uh, commercial video production. He's actually presented here before, like in 13. So um, he's going to give people ideas on that because these days, you know, having a, a, at least one good quality video on your products, essentially, or more. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you need to have a YouTube channel and, or, you know, be on other sites, too, as part of your social media. So that's what we got in the future. Um, everyone knows uh, about the disclosure rules, because everyone's been here before on your own invention. <laughs> so I'll just uh, do a round robin and start with Roberto? Sure. Oh, just out of curiosity, who moved into your old space down there? Somebody in the group. They don't make stuff that grows better. Green makes green. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Agriculture. Agriculture. <laughs> Okay. Is it in the market now? That's good. I mean, to partner up, get a, a, a catalytic effect. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, prior art, if you look at this first, th this I like the way they laid this out. We have a bunch of uh, timeline examples, and please ask questions at any time. But this is uh, how the Patent Office qualifies prior art to used or not be used against you based on your application file date. Okay, So the application file date in these timelines is at the bottom. In the prior arts, there's various disclosures and at the top. Okay, And when you see those arcing arrows that go backwards on the top, that's um, 
a publication of a patent after its file date. So the standard, and this is worldwide, is you, you file an application and it stays secret at the patent office for 18 months and then it goes public. Now they still have a program you can opt out of that, but if you do that, you can't file for them. So most people are, are in it, or if you don't do anything, it's a standard 18 month publication. Europe and Asia does this also. So th the, the purpose of it is to limit this sort of black hole to 18 months. Um, this started in 2001 here. It had been done in Europe and Asia, I think, for many, many decades. <laughs> so uh, it was to get rid of a, a patent fraud problem, which they're called submarine patents. <laughs> but in the old days, say the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, <laughs> um, you could literally you could file a patent and keep it pending for 40, 50 years if you wanted by filing uh, a nonstop series of continuation applications and never getting a patent issued, okay? And uh, if people didn't put their product in the market, this as-filed patent technology stayed secret from the public. So you go, well, why is someone doing this? Well, like any government program, someone figures out a way to commit fraud on it. Um, <laughs> let's say you, and this, this happened, I mean, someone files a patent in 1959 on some crude scanner technology, and then here we are, 1985, they're still pending on multiple continuations. They've never made and sold a product. They're just kind of gestating this technology it's secret at the patent office. There's no publication. They've never made the product, so it's still secret. But in the continuations, they refine the technology over time. So they're watching the market to see what other people are coming up with. And then as soon as someone launches a product and it looks close enough, they get that patent issued that's pending at the time and sue them for infringement or licensing royalty. So that's why they call it a submarine patent, because it comes up, <laughs> and it was previously unknown, and so they have priority of file date way back. They probably antedate the uh, current producer, the technology, and they could be successful. So. Well, it was the old rules were that the patent life was told from the issue date, 17 years. Yeah. So what happened in 01 <laughs> is we did the, we went with the 18 month publication. So that, that cropped the secrecy window to 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then we also changed the patent life to toll from 20 years from the file date. Actually, that was done in 95. And that, again, matches up the rest of the world, which is kind of nice. So Europe and Asia, everybody is 20 years from the file date. So it's simple. So now you can file continuations, but the life of the continuation is keyed from that first filing. So if I'm pending 15 years, my patent life's five years because it starts at the early one. But in the old days, you kept the shift going. So um, changing the, the timing of the patent life and this publication date um, knocked out a lot of that fraud <laughs> on submarine patents or the ability to, to do that. So that was, that was the key to it, plus matching up the rest of the world. So that was all part of the... And, that was going on prior, and the American Events Act uh, moved us to first to file, which 
the rest of the world does also. So we're all the same. Um, some people were against it, but let me tell you that the few cases I've been involved in, it's called interference. If you're trying to prove an early conception date before filing, the court's requirement for documentation is so high, most people fail. And the court says, well, if both parties failed proper documentation, it's first to file. That's what it defaults to. And that's what the rest of the world does. Yes and no. Um, you can't claim it as priority if it's over a year. And if it's issued, it's public. So all you can do then is you'd have to file new. You don't get to claim any priorities other than your file date. And it has to basically be a different invention. Well, can it be, you know, can I file for a European patent and the updates to the technology that I have? If it's not obvious. Yes. So it, it's got to be, it's got to be different. Um, and I say a fair amount different. And so what we're doing there, we're just calling that a new invention. Yeah. Because your old one is out and in the public domain, so. So like a, I don't want to say an update, but an added. Right, you added features to it, yeah. yeah. That's the only way you can recover foreign. Otherwise, you have to do everything within uh, that first year to claim your your priority. And it's uh, so that, unfortunately, it accelerates costs for people. If you file like a US provisional or a US non-provisional, okay, within the next 12 months, you've got to get your foreigners filed. So that's a big chunk of money. No, only US has provisional. <laughs> So, yeah, you have to file it. Huh? Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of different programs. Most people do what's called PCT. So uh, that enables you to delay specific countries for 30 months. So it, it delays um, your country filing expense from 12 to 30 months. So it's a help. And, and if you don't mind me asking, what would I expect in European patent? Uh, Probably the same as U.S. by the time you're said and done. Because you, the you use, the, use the U.S., but you're going to have to maybe do translation. You've got to pay a foreign agent. You're going to have to uh, do foreign issue fees, foreign annuity fees. So if you add all that together, if you say roughly budget 5000 a patent, it's probably pretty right. Because countries vary a lot. You know, like Chinese patents are cheap. Japanese patents are very expensive. Right, it's, it issues in a per country. <clears throat> the PCT and the, the European Patent Office, that's an upfront filing. They'll search it, they'll examine it, but at the end of the day, you say, I wanna go into these countries. So it's, it's nice in that if you do upfront amendments or upfront assignments, you only have to like update one application instead of every one in every country, so it's cheaper. And then before you commit to the countries, if the, if the PCT or the EPO go, oh, it looks good, we're, we're uh, recommending a grant of patent and you feel pretty good that your patent's approved. And if it isn't for some reason, then you can make that decision. So you're not, you don't have to commit to all these countries until you know Oh, where you first file? 
it actually doesn't matter. <laughs> you can go anywhere in the world, but I think you're going to obviously go where it's probably the least expensive and you don't have to do language translation to eliminate that cost. But uh, you could probably, I would say the best thing, if you're definitely going foreign, you may file PCT first because you'll get a search and examination quicker than you will at the U.S. Patent Office. And you'll know better, you'll know your patentability better No, there's no attachment. Except it will be, it'll be prior art against you. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, because they, I mean, people, that's one probably prior art myth is that under the certain conditions, they, they absolutely can use your own invention against you. <laughs> so... It's kind of like this, this continuation thing. You, you can keep filing patents, there's no limit, and you add features, and then they're all linked. The benefit of continuations is they cannot use your own patents against you. But when you file continuations, the uh, immediate prior application has to still be pending. So once you grant your patent, the door closes, and you have to file it as a new invention. So, like with the dental tool people, and what an advanced strategy in the patent world is, okay, we got a patent issued, but before we issued it, we filed a continuation. Yeah. Why? Just to keep an open pendency going. So we had that option to add stuff and put it in. And it's like you can file a continuation and maybe kind of a a bullshitty one, but it's just the point of you keep a placeholder I keep the door open. in patent pendency, yeah. And you know, so that's where the patent office being slow helps you. If it takes them two years to examine it, that gives you two years of pendency, so that gives you some breathing room. No, I got busy with other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And that the cost of it is, you know, some drawings, some text, and then a filing fee. But there's no limit on those continuations. You can file hundreds of them if you want. But so once the main patent closes and issues, all of them can stop. Unless you had a continuation okay, pending. So. I mean, if you had a continuation. On yeah, like in your case, what you could have done, like if your patent was issuing June 1, on May 31st, you could have filed a continuation just the day before. And then your patent issues the next day, and then the continuation is pending off into the future. Right, that's the beauty of continuations. The one beauty is that your own patent can't be used against you. Because you, what you're doing is you're attaching them all yes. legally so it is in, in a string. Right, it, it would mature into its own patent yeah. eventually. Oh, okay. But you're not, but your prior art, or I mean, the patent that you published on May, on June 1st, doesn't count against the continuation. Right. And whereas if they file the continuation and you're coming on June 2nd, so you can't file that same information. Right. You file then first. your own patent yeah. is prior art. Oh, and the trouble is, there's nothing closer than your own stuff. <laughs> there, there is a uh, funky procedure that it's called uh, re-exam. 
reissue. I mean, not re-exam. <laughs> so, uh, like in your case, you get a patent issued. You have a two-year window after that. You can refile that application. But the condition is nothing new. You can only adjust the claims. So I can't add a new feature. Right. But l let's say uh, you got a patent, you have three versions of your invention in it, and it issued on version one. Yes. And then like a year later you go, God dang, version two is what's selling. Right. So we'll file a, uh, a reissue. We'll rework the claims to emphasize and cover version two. And that the version two was already in the body of the application. Okay, uh -huh. that's the requirement. Yeah. But where we can kind of custom craft your claims to, to like pinpoint better what's commercially working. So the claims are available. Yeah, for limited periods. For a limited, so I have a two year window. And, and that's an automatic two year? I mean, it's up to two years. Everyone gets it, yeah. But uh, there's a risk in reissue that you don't have with continuations. So continuations, it's all additive. So I file a continuation and then my uh, patent issues the next day. This patent's out and issued and the continuation may mature into its own patent. So it, 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 I, I'm adding patents actually to the same technology. Reissue is a replacement in lieu of, so if we file the reissue on you, your original patent issue gets killed and the reissue is examined fresh. And so the risk is if version two doesn't get approved, you could end up with no patents. Right. And it's, so it's kind of yeah. scary. <laughs> and because of course other things are now issued. Other people are writing patents and stuff, and then so now there's more art that could but, but you because you're you're adjusting your claims within your disclosure, your priority date's the same as it always was. So you're, yeah, so you're safe in that respect. There's nothing, there shouldn't be anything new come in. Can you withdraw it? Probably. I mean, just as like if you, like the epiphany thing, it's not going to be issued. Can you withdraw that reissue if you stay with the original? I don't know when the, the point of no return is, but let's say you got a bad office action. I think uh, what they would make you do you'd probably respond and put the claims back to where they originally yeah, were and fine. say, reapprove this. Yes. And, and you know what? They may not. They may not. Yeah. But, <laughs> and the, um, the other problem with the reissues, they raise the fees. I, the one I just did, the file fee was like triple normal. I mean. Really? The, the, the fee for the reissue was like three times what a continuation fee. Continuation is just a standard new application fee. And so the reissue was like triple. I don't know why they do that. But. So continuations are like safe. The, in other words, you're adding to what you have and you're not risking losing what you've got. Reissues there's risk. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there is, just keep in mind, I mean, and, and everyone's stuck with this, you know, you do a patent early in the process and then you get into manufacturing and sales and inevitably you make some changes, right. add features, whatever. So there's, there's certain things we can do in the patent world to like make that patent kind of better fit what you got going on to be more valuable to you. Because we don't want the patent to be fixed here from your early version and then what you're making is way over here and that's what you need the protection, you know. Because a lot of times you'll see you know, you'll be searching a prior art and you go, oh, I've seen this product on the shelf, but it's like the patent and the product kind of look different. <laughs> so anyway, the whole point of this is 
due to pe publication at 18 months, it, it makes it a little confusing. And so the very first one here, uh, the bottom in red, okay, that's, I filed my patent application June 113, okay? And then all this top stuff is all kinds of prior art, okay? So what can be used against me, what can't? So what they're showing here is we had a publication A became public knowledge just before my filing. Publication B became public knowledge after my filing. Okay, so one was before me, one was after me. But if I trace them both back to their file dates, their file dates are earlier than me. So the moral of this story is both A and B can be used against you as prior art. Even though you um, filed, you didn't know about them, they became public, one of them became public after you filed. So this is, you're a victim of the 18 month black hole. Everybody has got this risk. But at least it's just 18 months instead of 50 years. <laughs> so this, this can be a gotcha, definitely, because like, Certainly like uh, application B, I had no clue that application B existed. I didn't find out about application B until after I filed, but application B has a file date that beats my file date. Okay, now they threw in a couple other things in there, uh, public use in Japan and a German patent application publication. Basically, those two occurred before my file date, so they're prior art against me, too. So the prior art is worldwide. And it doesn't have to be a patent or a publication. It can be just something out in the open. Anything, yeah. So this, this first one illustrates the publication bit, in other words, if this uh, close piece of prior art patent, if it published before me or after me, if its file date beats me in time, it's got me, okay? Right, because you didn't even know. Right. Now, in the real world, not a super huge problem because it's most likely application A and application B are going to be products in the market. Most people, as soon as they file, they put their product in the market. So if you're active in the market, you should know about them. And you should see patent pending on them and but there can be cases if, if somebody files a patent in the product, they never put it out. That was, that's what can screw you up. Well, you know, it's one of the things that I've noticed in this process. I've been talking to people, and all they do is buy patents. Big company. Buy them? Buy well, yeah, you get them faster that way. <laughs> you don't have to do us yeah, waiting they, around. They buy I should, uh, I'm, I'm really going to confuse the works, but this is so important. And we're a small room, we talk about it. Um, just because you get a patent doesn't mean you're not infringing. And, you know, and, and it's a reasonable expectation. Someone says, well, I got a patent. 
the patent office searched it. They said it was, you know, novel and non-obvious. Another pat prior art. I got a patent. Now someone's suing me for infringement. <laughs> How can this be? Well, the thing is, it's a different legal standard for patentability versus infringement. And this is a, another, the other catch-22. And that's not really related to this, because the patent office, they don't really deal in infringement. They just, still Their still patentability still. only, infringement supports. Oh, so we should talk about how is this possible? Well, let's say you have a device and it's got component A, B, and C. Okay, and you file the patent on it, and the, the closest prior art has component A and B. They could not, the patent office could not find component C in the prior art. Okay, it's not taught. So, patentability is an additive thing. If I have component C in my broad claim, I get a patent, because the closest patent only has A and B in it. I have a further limitation, assuming C is not obvious. So I get a patent, okay? Now I get a patent on what? A, B, and C. Someone else has a patent on A and B, right? So those suckers sue me for infringement. <laughs> the guy with the A and B pad. Oh, how does he do that? Well, the test for infringement is uh, reverse Boolean logic. So, the, the first company, they're making the product with A and B. I'm making it with A, B, and C. They say you're infringing. Why? Because my A and my B matches their A and their B. I've added C. Now that got me a patent, but that does not defeat infringement. Mm -hmm. So when you add to a product in infringement, you're still infringing as long as what you have there is in someone else's claim. Because if we let people do additive things in infringement, they'd get out of infringement all the time. Because they go, well, I just added a doohickey to your invention, so I, I'm not infringing. They do that all the time. So you're saying if you have A and you have B, you're infringing me. So in that case, you'd have to go back to company A and say, I want to license. And right. You're we got to come to an agreement. I need to license A and B yeah. from you to make my ABC product. Happens all the time. So that's just, uh, now I think granted in the real world this is not that common, but it's possible. But just keep in mind, like you get a patent, it, it makes you fairly safe from infringement, but not, not absolutely. And it, you know, and of course it would depend on if the company making AB is a competitor of yours and your ABC product is maybe a better product and you're stealing business from them, then, you know, but it could be you're, you're completely different uh, markets, right? right? You're not competitors, so. Anyway, on the, on the prior art, uh, whether it can be used against you or not, um, we've covered how publication works into that. So it doesn't matter when you got knowledge of the prior art, it matters when the prior art was filed. And you may not get that knowledge until after you file. <laughs> and that sucks, but that's... <laughs> okay.
So uh, advance to page 13, because they just went on about everything we talked about. So this is something new. So June 20th, 2014, I file widget X. Um, another person previous to that makes a disclosure of widget X at a trade show. So, is it prior art? Yes. On the assumption in the card, this explains in more detail, but this is like the basic rule. These are the exceptions. So, if the guy at the trade show, you know, knew me or was exposed to my product, or they say derived it from me, then he's not prior art. So, because, you, you know, what, I mean, it, they might have this in here, but we could say O'Brien made a trade show disclosure at another trade show dis, uh, November 20th, 2013, and then Stark saw it and made a trade show disclosure. So if that would be the case, I can kill Stark's disclosure as prior art to me because he derived it from me and he, he was exposed to me. So it's kind of like, and they give you, this is the, called the grace period date back one year. So I file, you can go back one year. And if there was somebody in here that had access to my technology and they disclosed it publicly and they got it from me, that is not going to mess me up. It's not going to be prior art. Right, so the, the safe thing to do is not disclose. See, because you got to go through all this to prove that they s had access to it and then they're, they're not, obviously not going to just totally agree. <laughs> so the moral of the story is file before you do any public disclosure you know I safe especially these days um, so I would say the strategy is file a half baked provisional earlier and then go with your final non provisional in a year that's more refined in the old days, you might have like waited to file until you refined it, but not now. It's it's better get the provisional in on like the invention half done, early date, is better overall. So now, how does that relate to the European file? So you have oh, the provisional will start the date on all the the form. So what happens is I got to file my U.S. non-provisional and my forms all at the same time. Oh, yeah. So the provisional starts the clock. So one year to file the other two. Yeah. Earlier. And why is that? So that you get you you get an earlier file date so that if somebody made a disclosure or filed another application within a few months of you, yeah. you're 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 just yeah. yeah. When you have date priority, your rights are as strong as they can be. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting this. He saw my invention. He copied it, you know, but you're going to have to prove all that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but if you really change the file and refine it, then it's much different than your half date. So.
So what happens is the common parts get the early date, the new stuff gets the later date, and that's the best you can do. So yeah, sometimes the provisional and non-provisional are identical, other times they're quite a bit different, but it is what it is. They don't even bother with it. That would only come up in court and litigation. So the the, the patent office will just go, um, okay, we got this non-provisional and we reference on its cover sheet, it's um, attached to a provisional, this number. They're done with it. So when you get into court, then your adversary is gonna go, your invention has five components Three were in the provisional, four and five were added in the non provisional. So they, they might find a piece of prior art between the provisional and non provisional that had components four and five in it and try to kill off your non provisional. That's a risk. But yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're in a horse race, but you don't know with who. Because yeah. you don't know what someone's doing in another city, state, or another country. You know? And you'd hate to be aced out by, like, a month. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anyway, page 15... I talked about it derives from you. That's kind of that example where O'Brien had a disclosure prior, excuse me, oh, prior to Stark, yeah. But Stark got it from O'Brien. And there's no more <laughs> so what that tells you is at least legally if if you disclosed your invention at trade shows publicly, but got your uh, application in within a year of that earliest disclosure, you're still legally safe, but you may be in for more hassle because of what people did in that one year. But you could do it that way. I mean, sometimes people go, well, I, just, I don't want to spend money in a patent until I see the, the market's reception of it. But a year is not that much of a time window, and it's, I, w I would still say, just get a quick and dirty provisional in, and then go to your trade show. It's still a better, safer option. And you can, you can put patent pending on all your stuff, so people are going to go, oh, as opposed to seeing nothing. So uh, the one on page 18 is kind of like page one, except that the inventor in the red at the bottom of the timeline has a, a relation back priority to a Canadian patent filing. So what that does for him um, is that the only prior art that can get him is that PCT that predates the Canadian filing. There's a lot of money that's going to change hands between the inventor and the original patent holder. So it's only uh, Irving's PCT that's priority. Oh, I might add, um, at least to my knowledge, pretty much, you can chime in, Roberto. 
but we talked about provisionals is only a U.S. thing, okay? Foreign, no provisionals, you file tax. Continuations is only a U.S. thing too. So like if you file a PCT and you go, oh, I want to file a continuation that has some new features. Yeah, you got to file a new PCT. So um, the continuation thing is a big bonus to the inventor because it, it just gives your patent flexibility, but only in the U.S. So that's, that's, because I, I had that come up with some clients and it's like, I thought, you know, I've never heard of continuations in Europe. So I confirmed, yeah, there's no continuations in Europe. Or, you know. <laughs> so page 20 shows the Canadian patent trumps everything above the timeline because it's got the early priority date. Of course, on page tw 20, that assumes that Bryant's invention in the Canadian and the US are identical. There's no, no changes mm -hmm. for it to be full priority. Page 23, that is prior art. Again, that shows the publication coming after file date. Now, actually, on 24, page 24, it's like the trade show thing, except instead of trade shows, it's patent filings. But if they, if they derive the invention from you, then you can kill off the prior art. And you'd probably want to like kill off their pending application. Um, but, that's a <laughs> but you could do this before in that when you file the patent application, you sign a declaration that says, I'm the inventor. So you could say, well, your declaration's false. You're not the inventor. <laughs> you took it from me. So that that's always been available in the law. Yeah. But the trade show thing, the trade show thing, no one did a declaration. So that's an additional thing they gave you if someone stole your invention. Oh, a lot of that strategy on you go after who you can get. <laughs> well, either that or who you can, you can get them out of the market. I mean, every case is different. But like, let's say it's a toy and it's manufactured in China. You just have a US patent. Say this would be fairly typical. Um, and my infringement rights are make, use, sell, offer to sell. So I can go after anyone in the sales and distribution chain. So I don't have a patent in China. I'm not really going to go after the manufacturer in China. But I'm going to go after the retailer in the United States because they're displaying them next to my product and they're cheap junky things and they're ruining my reputation. And so you would just send a cease and desist, say, to Target say, this product's infringing, quit carrying it. Um, yeah, you could work the customs too. <laughs> but like uh, like the, the big retailers, they don't want to, you know, they got 
uh, say a hundred thousand different products. They don't want litigation on their, these products. You know, they'll just go penny. And then mission accomplished. Right. You you cut off the infringer's sales outlet, and that's all you cared about. Now that infringer, he could make and sell in China. Nothing you can do about it. But you can you can any contact with the U.S. You can. But you know a lot of I mean like the big retailers and stuff they're gonna they're gonna carry stuff and I don't think they're they're gonna know or care or check. Cause I, I had this when I started I worked for a firm and we had knockoffs coming in and it was just. It was amazing. They copied the package style, the color arrangement. I mean, you really had to stare these things down to know the original from the knockoff. But it, it's weird with knockoff products. I mean, like that toy thing we had, that, you know, they could definitely bite into our business. But I don't know, if you take something like in the, in the fashion high end world, like what's probably the most knocked off product in the world? It's probably a Rolex watch. <laughs> so, but you know, the people that buy a knockoff Rolex for 40 bucks versus 4,000 for a real one, there's no crossover between those groups. You know, the Rolex is not losing business to the knockoff people. Not on a physical product, I mean, you could probably call it a, I'm gonna call it dilution of the product name because there's all these cheap Rolexes flooded all over. So that's that's kind of a different ball game. It's like they're not really harmful competitors, but they're harmful to image. You know, because of the, the quality and the so. Well, it's a lot harder to make, yeah. And yeah, in fact, there's a famous case. It's roaring. They're not so big now, but I think in the 70s there was those replica cars, so they'd take a Volkswagen chassis and they'd make a fiberglass body of a Ferrari or a cord from the 1930s, and then it would look like it. So, Ferrari sued one of those replica car companies. And so, it, again, it's the same thing. The person who buys a real Ferrari and the person who buys a replica are not running the same. They're not, they're not running in the same circle. <laughs> right. So, but Ferrari sued on uh, blurring and tarnishment of their image and um, trade dress and design patents. So that is kind of like appearance ornamentality. And they were saying that, but these replica cars, they make a silhouette. They look like a Ferrari to the casual observer. And the thing is with Ferraris, we make them in restricted quantities. We make people who are willing to spend 300,000 on a car wait a year or two for it. So. Uh, the whole point is the uh, the exclusivity of the brand and the replica cars were diluting that. So they won their case. Even though it was, you know, again, it's a luxury good thing. It's not, they're not competitors. But they have an obligation to their customer base. Right, because the, the people that own Ferraris want their values to remain high because they're, it, it, it's like just pure economics, right? Supply, demand. So the supply is restricted to be below demand. Therefore, price stays high. Yeah. Someone was having it fixed in their shop in England, and 
just found one in the barn and it's it's selling for like a hundred thousand dollars. And it's a replica. <laughs> well, you know, if if the replica is very good quality. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um I mean, I'll admit, I bought a $40 Rolex in Europe, and a guy came and he opened his jacket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it, it, looked, it looked so good. Oh, sure. And, and, you know, you wear it, and you think, well, you know, if I get mugged and someone steals it, I'm going to go, you have jokes on you. <laughs> But it was, uh, I noticed that in, I think it was Italy a lot, there would be these guys and they would roll out a, a blanket or carpet on the sidewalk and they were selling uh, knockoffs of leather goods, Louis Vuitton purses and the, all this stuff. And it, like, you look at it, it's like, it looks pretty good. Of course, it's, you know, one one hundredth of the original price. And then the, the police would come down the street and the guys would roll up the blanket and they would just take off. <laughs> you see that in New York a lot. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah people, you have someone, you hear someone like screaming and you think, oh, that's gone. Yeah, like they're, they're used to moving quickly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, I get, you know, people... Maybe a woman wants a Louis Vuitton replica purse. I got a, uh, a Rolex as a drag gift for Christmas. I was so mad. It's like, how could you afford to buy me a Rolex? I was like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> it's pretty rare. <laughs> my, my brother got gave me one and then I, I opened it, tried to look for that time because it, it was a little <laughs> off. No? And, and, and a couple of screws. Now, if you go to page 25, it's a little bit different twist. Um, so in the red, this guy Chase at the bottom, he, he did a uh, public disclosure to trade show. And then exactly at a year, he filed his patent application. So he's solid. And then Campbell at the top, filed an application in between those two dates, but he preceded Chase's patent file date. Okay. So, who wins, right? Well, Chase does, because that's one of the exceptions. So, you know, we say we're first to file, but you can defeat prior art for up to a year before your file date. But you have to be human enough to spend the money to do it. Because this, this is not going to be inexpensive. Right. Yeah, because you're going to be in a dispute with... Campbell and Chase Campbell. are not going to be friends. <laughs> Well, we make an inference here, the gods at the patent office, but they're going to say that um, Campbell was antidated by Chase's public disclosure. So theoretically, uh, Widget X was in the public domain 
before Campbell filed. Right, so Campbell doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't get to stop Chase. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, and Chase can go ahead. With well, I guess what, what we infer, and of course this is nice knowing, but we could say that Campbell knew about Chase because it was in the public domain, even though he maybe, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but yeah, no, it was available. Yeah. So, it, uh, you can win the ribbon for patent work if it's in the public domain. Well, I guess Chase's would be, right? Yeah, Chase, Chase he did it within a year. Because he did it within a year. Well, he did it to public disclosure, right? Oh, it's not in position. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that's what they're saying. But the moral of the story is it would have probably been better for Chase to file December 16, 2012. And then it would have been, well, let me put it this way, him uh, knocking Campbell out as prior art would have been automatic. In this scenario, Chase has got to provide documentation to prove the trade show. I mean, he's got to do extra work. Yeah, it's a proof issue. All that 26 shows, and this comes up once in a while for big companies, but if, if the two competing pieces of prior art come under the same ownership, then they're not prior art. If for some reason one company acquired another. I guess that's one way to get rid of prior art. Why? By the company, <laughs> the, <laughs> the patent. That's a good question. I think a number I saw individuals was like in the 15% range. Corporations, 85%. Yeah. Right, it's over half. Ever since 2004, more come from outside the U.S. than inside. And the thing is, the uh, so the patent office gets uh, annually as about six hundred and fifty seven say seven hundred thousand applications a year. Now, um, in the in the uh, in the days when you had this first to conceive, not first to file, that's called an interference. You know how many interference cases there were out of, say, 700,000? About 150. Okay. Yeah, so it was like, it was such a minuscule number compared to the overall activity that, like I said, this first to file thing really affects nobody. <laughs> and actually, I think it's to the benefit of the individual inventor because you wouldn't want to get involved in an interference because that's expensive litigation. So date priority is simpler, cleaner, and cheaper. And that favors the small guy, I think. Well, you I see why Europe had to go. I mean, they had all these countries all doing it. It was just, it was 
Yeah, and it's just, it's so they, they call it, they made it a race to the patent office, but it's just, it's a clean, fair system. If you filed with the European Patent Office, it, <clears throat> the rule of thumb is, it depends how many foreign countries you want, but if it's probably one or two, it's probably more economical to file direct in those countries. But if you want, say, five foreign countries, then it's probably more economical to file either PCT or EPO first. Uh, well, you can do it online, but it's not as easy to dig up the information. <laughs> but it, it really, what you really got to think about is which foreign countries you want and get that in your mind first, and then the right way to do it is easy. But you got to figure out the countries you want. So if that's two, it's probably most economical to just file direct in those two countries. Because yeah. the, uh, like if you go into the, well see the, the European Patent Office, the EPO, that just covers Europe. If you go with PCT, it covers most of the countries in the world. It basically covers the countries in the WTO, World Trade Organization, but that isn't 100%. So where is the, you, you see the data? You, you can look it up online, but you know, it's gonna cover, I think it's like 144 countries. It's gonna cover, you know, Asia, like Japan, Korea, China, Australia, all of Europe, Russia, <laughs> India, where it's not going to cover a good part of Africa, some of the Middle East, um, and there's some oddballs in there. I think Taiwan isn't. But you know, PCT, I tell people, hey, you're 99% safe because it's going to cover most anywhere you're going to be doing business. Because the, the countries that aren't in it tend to be more the third world. They're, they're not going to have a consumer base in manufacturing. And North Korea, uh, North Korea. Yeah, North Korea you're not going to get, and probably yeah. Yemen, yeah. Uh, Somalia yeah. is yeah. not going to be there. <laughs> Although they're, you know, they're slowly but surely expanding and adding countries over time. I mean, I think it. Right, we're kind of, we are going to a world patent. I mean, slowly but surely. At least the way the patents are done and the rules are going to be the same everywhere, and I think that helps. Yeah, everybody. But I, I tell people that, you know, the, the cost of foreign patents is going to be an issue, but you really, you got to make sure that, um, let's say you get a patent in Germany, that you've got sales and manufacturing there to utilize the patent, that you, you know, you need to, you need to have commerce in that country to make it worthwhile for you. Yeah. And that's a lot more money to set up. Now, sometimes people will go, well, 
No, I'm not saying I'm manufacturing so Germany, but I want to I want to find a German company to license to. That could be a possibility, you know, if you find, right. you know, like especially getting into a remote market, find a company that makes a product similar to yours, and then maybe you can license to them and use their, because they have the connections in the country and the yeah, sales yeah, distribution. The sales distribution. We, we did that when I was an engineer, like with our pump technology, we licensed out to a company in Tokyo. There was another pump company. But, you know, we use their factory, their salespeople, and then they just made our product under license. So Boy, it's anything you want. It, um, it's all over the place. I've seen agreements go from literally as low as 0.2% up to like 25%. And it depends on the circumstances of the deal. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all over the place. Because the, the, the agreement is custom in that the parties split of their tasks and responsibilities and how much they do marketing and production wise. And the involvement of one party with the other. And it's like, is it exclusive? Does it cover certain territories and markets? And I mean, typically the rule of thumb is if you give someone exclusive, then you, your hands are tied with them. So you're gonna demand a higher royalty or upfront fees or minimum guaranteed royalties or some sort of conditions because you can't, go to anyone else and so well, these guys would have to that. yeah I tell people either if it's exclusive you got to get more out of it and if they don't want to do that then make the term short so that if it isn't working out for you you, you can get out of it within a year or two you're not you're not tied up three five or more years because it the, the worst deal is they, they tie up your technology and then they're not doing anything with it. They're sitting on it. That's the worst risk, really. They sit on it and then you can't go to anyone else. So you gotta prevent that. Or sometimes they'll, they'll take it and, and change it so much that it'll go outside the patent. And <laughs> Yeah, I just, I, I tell people, you know, you get a license agreement, it may be the start of problems, I don't know. I mean, it is a nice nirvana. And uh, if, they're <laughs> if they're paying you a lot of royalties, they're probably trying to figure out how to pay you less royalties. Because <laughs> so, and you know, the, the royalty thing, especially, I, I saw an interview with, Calvin Klein on you know licensing out their name and trademarks, so they have they have a whole staff that polices their licensees to make sure they're not lying on, you know they sold this many then they say in the royalty payments are selling this many, and they in other words, your licensee is doing an end run around you. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, your your licensee is in the best position to be your worst competitor because they know more about you. They, they have access to everything, yeah. So um, I tell people probably, I mean, we can do a, a nice agreement, but your best protection is probably to really investigate this potential licensee and see how their past deals went and if their past license partners are happy because if they've had a lot of problem with past licensed people you're going to have problems probably because it's like a it's like a partnership you know 
So you have to trust him. Because you're giving him the keys to the store, so to speak. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, that this thing, um, if you understand how the publication works, so the publication isn't as important as the file date that determines whether it can be used against you as prior art. Common ownership gets rid of it. If the prior art was derived or stolen from you, that gets rid of it. And never forget the one-year disclosure rule. And also that if you get a patent, you're still infringing it, maybe. <laughs> and uh, re reissues, well, um, risky, but could be helpful. But you know, it's like, here's to give you an idea. How many patents are we at about, we're at about nine million now in the US? You know how many reissues there are? 40,000. 40,000 to 9 million. So it's kind of a rare, yeah, just a few people use it. Yeah, they're not very high. Not very high at all. And like design patents are not very high. What are they, three, 400,000? Compared to nine million utilities, and then there's plant patents that are even more rare. But I don't. Th yeah, I don't think uh, no one's doing plant patents on marijuana yet. But there are there are utility patents on marijuana. Lots of them. Methods of uh, extraction, stuff like that. Cannabinoids, they call them, yeah. So like if you, uh, even though marijuana is federally illegal, if I file a patent on a machine that extracts <laughs> cannabinoids from marijuana, it's, it's fine. I can get a patent on that. Well, that, that the weird thing, the thing really, the patent office, they don't, they will not reject you for illegality or regulatory issues. They don't care. All they look at is the prior art. So you, here's another kicker. You could get a patent on a product you can't make because sure. it's illegal otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the weird thing is the trademark office is really, because, you know, since the legalization of marijuana, medical marijuana, there's been a lot of people filing trademarks on, let's say, canna, C-A-N-N-A. -N -N and the trademark office comes back and goes, you know, that's an acronym for cannabis. That's illegal. Your trademark's rejected. No federal trademark because it's an illegal substance. So the trademark's like Yeah. Now you can, you could do a state of Colorado on cannabis. Can. Sure. It's fine. Starbuds. Huh? Star, instead of Starbucks. Starbuds. Starbuds. <laughs> now you might, uh, I, I bet that would be a federal rejection, but you could probably do a Colorado state trademark on it. But then Starbucks might sue you for dilution. But then, you know, I mean, small businesses, they'll just start using a name. They don't register nothing, you know. And then they get screwed because they spent $10,000 on a nice neon sign, and then they get a cease and desist letter. I, I had a, uh, there was a case, uh, okay, BMW, the car, and someone had a uh, spa called BMW Spa. Stood for body, mas body massage works. So they got a cease and desist from BMW <laughs> Auto. Totally different class. Because they're famous. Yeah. Uh, they can 
So that BMW. Yeah, so they're they're just going to say, you you can't put BMW in anything, because that's that's universally well known, and we're protecting that. But you know, people start a business, and you know, you immediately start putting money in a name because you're having stuff printed, you're whatever. You're one of the lucky ones. Usually the, the opposition will kill it. I mean, th this is where sometimes lawyers and law firms are looking for work and they get a little ridiculous. Like they'll make an opposition on a mark and the names are kind of close but not exact. But the two companies are just, they're not competitors at all. No. So it's there's no economic sense to it and they're just generating legal hours and of course, the small company that filed the trademark, they don't want to fight the opposition. So they, you know, they drop it and the, the other company wins. Uh, we, I, uh, yeah, I had that uh, with um, Mattel, Rock'em Sock'em Robot. Yeah, because they're just going to go, well, and I would tell people this, you're going to fight this opposition. This could cost 20,000 bucks. It's like, let's just pick a new name and refile. It's like $600. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't get, and you know what, that 20,000, you fight the opposition, it's like, there's no guarantee you win. You may or may not win. So it's kind of like you could use that 20000 in a lot of different, better ways. Well, it's a trademark something. You can change the name. Yeah. It's just your name. And there was, I think I had a special font that I could change the sign on. And all it did was have to change the pocket to Marcus. And it was fine. <laughs> yeah. It's like more than paid for it. So I gave him the one check. You know they can come back at any time and do that because there's an opposition period, but they can they can still uh, oppose you at any time. So I tell people don't even don't even conceptualize picking a name that's close to something well known because it'll just be a waste of money. We'll get a cease and desist. So. Anyway, that's that's all I have. I hope you learned a few things. This is see there uh, there can be some strategies here if you have a patent pending you're rejected against a piece of prior art. You can always look at is there a way I can like wipe this off the slate? This piece of prior art somehow. So I, you know because I I if I can't wipe it out I'll have to argue against it. The easier strategy, if I can. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so if you litigate something like that for the tens of thousands of dollars, what if you go to someone you know that this person is just a single inventor working in his garage and offering ten thousand dollars? 
yeah, buy the patent. And then, and then go to the patent office and go, here's my proof, it's time on ownership. Yeah. No prior art. No prior art. But it's nice to know there's some options there. You know, it's kind of like you can fight the problem, but maybe it's easier to try to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> See, don't, you don't have to fight it. That's all I have. That's all for me. Thank you. I'll go turn off the.